notched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tech. Here's Steve Dace. Greetings. Welcome to another week of Bigger Ten. I am Steve Dace alongside my co-host, but you know by now, never partner. One and only Aaron McIntyre. And uh, Aaron, we have crazy breaking news to get to in this league already. You ready to go? Let's just get to it. Absolutely. So... Uh, the kind of news that makes you reorder what the Big Five on Bigger Ten is going to be. Uh, Paul Chris, despite a 720 win percentage, is gone. Uh, he has been canned at uh, the University of Wisconsin after he got completely annihilated by former Wisconsin coach Brett Bielema, which had to be had to have factor into this to some extent, don't you think? Yeah. To some and to see with you know Illinois come in, hold you to two yards rushing. Um, and Wisconsin. That's unbelievable. That is, that's just an unbelievable me. stat. I, I agree with you. Um, and it's 34 to 10. And frankly, I don't know that it was that close. Okay. Graham Mertz, the, the quarterback recruiting coup of all time, highest rated quarterback recruit Wisconsin's ever had, ended up really being the, the, the guy that got uh, Paul Christ fired. Just could not develop him. It couldn't pan out, never worked. The last couple of years, it's been very un Wisconsin like. You go back to the COVID year. Aaron, and we talked at the time. I mean, the I mean, Wisconsin having to shut its program down a couple times for not being able to keep up with COVID protocols. We would have figured what that that would have been the program like Northwestern yep. that year that would have dominated. They were the big culture program, right? Not so. You had the issue with players who were fist fighting. Remember one of them, Jalen Berger, who's now at Michigan State. Um, I mean, just a, a lot of drama, un Wisconsin like. You started to feel like, you know, well, maybe, maybe that culture is not as airtight as we thought. And then this year, it seems like maybe that bubble burst. Chris is gone. I think the reason why they made the move now is because they're sitting there, although, although it's not had a great year so far, but they're sitting there with an all star defensive coordinator, one of their own, and Jim Leonard, who could have gone to the Green Bay Packers a couple of years ago. And before they bring in another coach who, of course, will want somebody not named Jim Leonard looking over his shoulder, right? Okay. So before you say goodbye to Jim Leonard, let's just make sure we're not sitting on the next Wunderkind, right? So let's fire Chris now, even though the buyout's massive. $19 million. Thank you, new Big Ten TV deal. All right. So Paul Chris will get about $20 million to walk away. And you've given about uh, more than half of a season for Jim Leonard as interim coach to show whether he can handle the big chair or not. If he can, if they turn the season around, Leonard will be the head coach and they'll maintain the, the Barry Alvarez culture. If not, then I think they open it up, do a nationwide search, and then the future of Wisconsin football and it's you know the way that it looks, I think becomes kind of up for grabs at this point. But what's your perspective as an Iowa fan that has fought these guys in that division for how many years and how many times has Wisconsin been the program in Iowa's way, and yet they're the program here that pulled the plug on their coach? Well, first of all, you see Paul Christ walking down the street. Your first thought is, boy, that guy looks like he's got $20 million in his bank account. <laughs> um, but uh, congratulations, Mr. Christ. Um, yeah, this was um, this was a lot of credit to Illinois. Obviously, a much improved team. But I've never seen a Wisconsin team as hapless, as hapless as this. Usually by this point, against even or lesser converse, uh, competition in the season, you see... Wisconsin kind of hit its stride a little bit. We've seen in past years in the non-conference slate, I've brought up BYU a couple of times, you know, they, they'll drop one or not look especially good. Uh, I think it was five, six years ago. I remember even you and I took him down to the wire. It happens. That's what happens in a developmental program. This year, it's felt a little bit different. And... And this was confirmation, obviously. That something's wrong there. We saw the chinks in the armor, the cracks in the foundation. As you've said, the last few years in the offseason, just more drama than what we're, um, what we're accustomed to. But now it's, 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 um, it's, it's go time. So I don't know what's happened there. I don't know why, if he's just not a charismatic enough or if he doesn't command the respect enough. I will say this, though. Wisconsin fans are not happy with Jim Leonard right now either. 
And yeah, they got torched too. That, that's his defense. And he coaches defensive backs as well for Wisconsin. And they got, uh, they got, I mean, they got their butts handed to the them last the couple weeks. Day. They've been torched actually. Exactly. So yeah. I'm not really sure, you know, you couldn't ask for a, a better schedule, I guess, um, for Jim Leonard to, to try out. But uh, as an Iowa fan, I'm looking at this and I would, I would be loving it if Iowa's offense didn't also suck. You know, I, I would love that. I would drink this. I would drink this up for in then twice subscribe on to Wisconsin website exactly. just to be on their message yeah. boards. Yeah, I would love this. <laughs> but uh, I was having some pretty existential problems of their own right now. So I'm not able to enjoy it as much as I I wish I could take it from a Michigan fan here. Um, the best case scenario for Wisconsin. Is that Jim Leonard turns it around here. And ends up, you know, the team ends up, you know, winning five or six games down the stretch here, and you give him the job. Here's why. Bo Pelini. Michigan is living proof that it's not easy, as, as easy as it seems on message boards, to go outside of your culture and find a way to make it work. Now, when you do, it can be masterful, Right. Michigan finally went outside of its culture 40 years ago or 50 years ago and hired a guy named Bo Schembechler. Alabama finally went outside the Bear Bryant culture after, you know, two decades of entropy and hired a guy named Nick Saban. But for every time you go outside your culture for the fresh voice and it works, a lot of other times it does not, right? I mean, Michigan went to Rich Rodriguez, the hottest coach in the country at the time. It turned down Alabama. Rich Rod was offered that Alabama job. If he takes it, Nick Saban's never the coach there, right? And so they had the hottest coach in the country. It was just too much change. You saw what happened when they brought Gary Anderson in about a decade ago. It was too much change for Wisconsin, and he was actually winning games. It is no, and, and right now, I promise you, in Lincoln, Nebraska, Aaron Trev Alberts is rooting like hell for Jim Leonard. Yeah. Because a lot of this, if, if Jim Leonard does not pan out, those two schools are basically going to try to hire from the same head coach candidate pool. And then I guess we'll find out which school has the more coveted gig at the moment, right? Okay. But if I'm a Wisconsin fan, the best case scenario is Leonard turns this thing around. Here's what I would do if I was Jim Leonard. The number one thing I would do, because this is what I think has broken the Wisconsin culture. And I think, I think Graham Mertz did. And I think it's it, the whole NIL stuff, right? He's out there. Pimp, he was like the first Big Ten player I saw with his own brand. It's just, it's not Wisconsin, right? And even if the other guys are terrible, I've seen, I've seen Wisconsin quarterbacks that could not throw the ball to the sideline get to the Big Ten championship game or the Rose Bowl. That's why I was, I, I was, I, I mean, I was defecating in my pants that one game against Illinois. Oh crap! Mm-hmm. It's Wisconsin they finally with an, got one. an, an yes. amazing quarterback. The, I think the continual reliance on Mertz and the fact that there was no one that was really, you know, allowed to challenge him for the job or no one was recruited to challenge him for the job. And every time they put it on that kid, he face plants. I think it kind of broke their culture a little bit. Here's what I would do if I was Jim Leonard. I wouldn't try to actually wind the clock forward. I'd wind it back. Whoever is the backup, even if he's not any good, can he hand the ball to Braylon Edwards 30? Braylon Edwards. Braylon Allen 30 times without throwing three picks? Yes? Cool. Do that. Go back to what you know how to do. I'd bench Mertz. Bring the next guy in and go hyper game manager. I think Chris was too enamored with Mertz's talent and kept trying to put the game into his hands. And the kid, I don't, I just don't think can be that player. And I think unless, except for a Friday night against Illinois. During the COVID year, we have three years of tape now. Aaron telling us this. This okay? goes back to your conversation too with uh, with Mark yesterday, talking about uh, JJ McCarthy. You know he's going to run the same offense. Mm-hmm. Okay, they didn't change the offense for him. It's just he brings a new dynamic. That that's what I don't think Wisconsin got about Graham Mertz. Mm. Run your dang offense, mm-hmm. and then his abilities. Within that, you know, let it let him shine when he has the opportunity to. But I think they tried to change too much uh, to Taylor and give him more opportunities in the air. And I just, it's not obviously working out for him. All right, let's stay in the Big Ten West. An absolute stunner over the weekend. I guess, man, I mean, maybe you need your number one tailback and number one receiver, right? Minnesota, 
loses at home to Purdue, and now it's officially Wheel of Destiny wide open in the Big Ten West because Minnesota had the huge scheduling advantage. They had won a road game against an East team. They didn't have to play Michigan and Ohio State. Um, And so if you look at every year, the team that's won the West except one time didn't have to play two of the three, Michigan, Ohio State, or Penn State. So Minnesota looked looked like it had a huge scheduling advantage, and then it just turned right around, Aaron, gave that game away uh, to Purdue, who then took it from him in the fourth quarter. And, you know, he looks like the kid, he looks like a choir boy, man. All right. But that quarterback at Purdue's got some stones, brother. I mean, I love the way he plays football. He is a gunslinger, made a couple of big throws down the stretch. And now we're sitting at ESPN's FPI right now. Has Purdue and Minnesota projected to finish tied at six and three? We've never had a team with more with with uh, three conference losses win any kind of conference championship in Big Ten history or one of these divisions. Never happened before. That's the current projection. I, I'm not even sure we can avoid it. We'll get into that more with feedback in the week of the week later. But this was a big loss for the rest of the division for Minnesota to lose this one and at home. And I think it really opens up the division race now even more than it already was. Well, I said last Wednesday when you uh, put us on the sh- on the spot and uh, said, you know, what are we, what are we talking about coming out of the weekend? My number one thing was, I th- I had a weird feeling about this game in Minneapolis. I didn't know then that Ibrahim was being out. Nobody did until Saturday morning. I had a weird feeling about this game, and uh, Purdue I just thought was due to get one somewhere to pull off to pull off a close one somewhere uh, at some point. After the close ones to Penn State and Syracuse, you yeah, mean? Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. So I, I thought they were due, and um, man, th- that's just a soul-crushing <laughs> a soul crushing loss for Minnesota. I mean, you were favored by, what, 10 points, 12 points, I think it was, something, some, somewhere in that range. Uh, you've got it rolling. You look, you've not really shown any weaknesses so far this season, and then all of a sudden, I, I don't, you know, Chris Ottman Bell, big loss for them. But they came out last week against Michigan State. They looked just fine. Uh, I think we're finding right now uh, there are a couple of key places, and they are key pieces, but you wouldn't have expected that much of a drop off, that much of a drop off from just losing two players. Great, although they are, you, uh, you, you've still got to have some next guy up mentality. And I don't, I don't know what happened there. Let's go next to Iowa City, and this was a rematch of uh, last year's Big Ten Championship game between uh, the Wolverines and the Hawkeyes. I broke this game quite a bit, uh, or broke it down quite a bit over on the Michigan podcast side of things here on the channel yesterday. So let's get your thoughts now from uh, the Hawkeye fan perspective. Michigan goes into Iowa City, wins 27-14. to It's the first time a top five team has won by double digits at Kinnick since 2006 when number one Ohio State did it. It's only the second time. This century, a top five team has done it. Uh, Since 2008, top five teams, one in five overall at Kinnick Stadium. And the one win, Penn State threw a touchdown pass on the final play of the game to win it. So when Jim Harbaugh, Aaron, talks about Kinnick Stadium, is quote, where top five teams go to die, end quote, history shows he was not being hyperbolic about that, but the Wolverines found a way to get it done. Yeah, it's not the it's not the historic win in the classical sense of the word historic because of Iowa's just inabilities on offense. And again, I would like to reiterate what I said last week too. If you enjoy some of the recruiting uh, bonuses and benefits and uh, the the resources that Michigan has, why you only beat Iowa a team like Iowa this year's Iowa team by thirteen points? Just that's not exactly impressive to me. Uh, also, it's hard to tell in the stadium. The only thing that I saw after the game was the unsportsman, or I think there was the unnecessarily roughness penalty for a pancake block. Apparently, you can't do that against Michigan or something. Um, I, I have been told by at least one person that the officiating was pretty bad. Pretending it was pr- perfectly officiated, pretending that it was historic win in the classical sense of the word, Michigan just at the point of attack and really on both sides of the line of scrimmage was just more physical and more uh, just imposing than Iowa was for the entire game. And uh, I I would say, you know, I I, I would say one thing I would be really, really encouraged about as, again, pretending that this was an actual decent team that they beat, and it was a a great defense. I said last week, Iowa's defense is one of the best that I've seen. Um, but pretending all else being even that this is one of the, 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 the you know, average Iowa teams that you go in to play at Kinnick Stadium. Uh, 
Uh, the game plan was very, very good. But it's one thing to have a game plan. It's another thing to be disciplined. Michigan was very, very disciplined. I was very impressed by that. Because one of the ways that Iowa's defense can make you and bait you into uh, mistakes is if you get undisciplined, if you get, uh, start, start to get a little bit uh, selfish and anxious, um, they'll, they'll make you pay for that. But, man, the high percentage in terms of not taking a loss of, of yards on plays, uh, no long def- – I, I mean, I could count on less than one hand the number of longish developing routes run by Michigan, at least in the first half. Very, very good. Very, very uh, disciplined. That's really encouraging because I think uh, another thing that I think this proves that Jim Harbaugh has really grown. Actually, I really do believe that. I think he is less stubborn than he once was. I think this is actually a sign that he respected uh, that he respects his opponents as well. Um, so whatever. One thing I would be uh, concerned about if I were a Michigan fan. On non-obvious passing downs, y'all got like zero pass pass rush, and that's against an Iowa offensive line that is uh, not very good. Um, so I won't I won't say zero, but it wasn't good enough. And that was you know it. This is an Iowa offensive line where you should be able to get to the quarterback every single time, and uh, you, you just didn't. So I would be concerned about that. But overall, you know, it's a good win for Michigan. Um, wouldn't read too much more into it other than just the discipline. And that is, that is a pretty, pretty big deal. Speaking of concerns, let's go to East Lansing. Last year was a magical year for Michigan state. Kenneth Walker, the third was phenomenal. They rode him to an 11 win season, won a new year, six bowl. Mel Tucker was big 10 coach of the year. All of that very much earned, but this year now Michigan state has a three game losing streak. It's next four games. Ohio State, where Mel Tucker this week at his press conference was begging Sparty Nation not to sell their tickets to Buckeye fans. Good luck with that. There's going to be 20, 30 thousand Buckeye fans there. Uh, But uh, Michigan, they've they've got Ohio State, Wisconsin coming in with Jim Leonard now trying to prove himself. And then they are at Michigan and at Illinois. And they've still got to play Penn State later this year as well, right? So you got to start asking yourself of even getting to a bowl game is at risk for this Michigan State season at the moment. And a lot of things have gone wrong with Michigan State. But the bottom line is they just don't have that tailback to turn and hand the ball off to to make something happen for them when the game is on the line. And I think that's the biggest thing that is missing. And, And I think you're seeing that maybe Kenneth Walker won two or three games for Michigan State last year by himself. Like the Miami game, maybe he won that game. The Michigan game, I can promise you, he won that game by himself. And maybe we're, maybe, is it hard? Are we finding out now that if anything, we underrated how important and how good Kenneth Walker was last year? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to do because, as we talked about with Mo Ibrahim in Minnesota, it's hard to believe how much one player in football and basketball that's a completely different animal. I mean, you understand one guy can be the difference between making it to the NCAA tournament or Sweet Sixteen, and you know, not even competing for that level of uh, accomplishment at all. But it's uncommon where an entire side of the football is just just drops off with one guy or one departure, or one injury. And I think that's part of what we're seeing with with Michigan State as well. So I think we're into, and, and I, I would guess that Mel Tucker is going to get into the, okay, I got to get some recruits in here and then develop guys because we've talked about this ad nauseum. It seems like you can get some flash in the pan. You, it seems like you can kind of put together one season, one or two seasons with the transfer portal, uh, but you're not going to live by that. So I, I think that's probably what we're we're seeing coming home to roost right now. Finally, let's go to Pat Fitzgerald. And if you are a longtime consumer of my football content, you know I love me some Pat Fitzgerald. So uh, it, I, I, I take no joy in saying this, but I have to ask. If you can't win a game when you get five takeaways on defense, are they winning another game? Are they going 1-11? And that new stadium looks really cool. It does. I think dude, that stadium looks pretty dope. I yes, mean, it does. you're you're spending eight hundred million dollars. I think the new, uh, the 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 U.S. Bank Stadium. I'm trying to remember if that was one billion or one point five billion. But still, you're in that neighborhood for a thirty five thousand seat stadium. 
Uh, what was pointed out to me by one of my buddies who actually listens to this program is like, hey, this is a great idea. You're keeping all of that sound yeah. inside there, and you yeah. got the canopies. I know this is not what the co- the conversation was supposed to be. This is what I want to talk about with Northwest. This is a great idea. You know, you got a small fan base anyway. Make it as loud as possible. And my buddy Jeff pointed out to me, you realize they're still not going to show up. And most of the time when they're playing Ohio State and Michigan and Iowa and Illinois at home, it's going to be their fans actually yeah. filling up that stadium. It's going to boomerang on them. But, uh, yeah, Northwestern sucks. They, they, they are very bad. We'll come back. Let's play our weekly game of Would You Rather here next. Steve Dace here, and we get asked all the time, how can we support what you guys are doing here on the channel? Well, one great way to do it is by supporting us on our Patreon. And by doing that, you might get a little extra support yourself as part of our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Pause that right there, Aaron. Scroll up just a little bit. Look at what that record is in Major League Baseball as of the time we are recording this. Over 100 games over 500 as we get down to the stretch run of the season. Uh, in our NFL picks contest, we started 5-0 and in week one. Um, you may have an opportunity to more than earn the money back that you donate to us each week here on our Patreon page by signing up and getting access to our exclusive information like our exclusive handicapping picks in various sports. So thank you to all of you who support us each week here uh, on Michigan Podcast and Bigger 10. And if you'd like to join them and maybe make a little extra money in the process patreon.com slash michigan podcast for as low as five bucks a month patreon.com slash michigan podcast time now for our weekly game of would you rather and aaron as always we begin with you would you rather keep brian ferentz as oc or have to replace Kirk and Brian Ferentz both if that's what Kirk Ferentz said was the price of wanting that change. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Because I, I don't know I, I don't know whose offense this is. I don't know if this is Brian Ferentz's offense or if this is Kirk Ferentz's offense. I can answer that for you. It's yes. Be- it, because since Kirk took over, you guys have been like in the top 80 in offense three times like in his so whole career. So it's Kirk Ferentz's offense. Yeah. You know what's really odd? And maybe remember uh, the Holiday Bowl a couple of years ago when Iowa played USC? Do you remember off the top of your head in your photographic encyclopedic uh, memory of football, was USC really bad on defense that year? I don't remember if they were terrible, but you put up like a 40-burger on them, right? Yeah, and then we put up 55 on Ohio State. I, I don't understand. Like, in the like play even calling, if USC was terrible, they still would have been like a top 60 defense and, with that talent. And like those those things stick out because that doesn't happen very often against good conver- uh, competition. Mm-hmm. But they also stick out because I thought the play calling was actually imaginative, creative, keeping mm-hmm. the defense guessing. I don't know who whose offense that was those times. So I'm actually... The, the more the season goes on, I'm actually willing to give Brian a little bit more of a leash than I am Kirk right now hmm. because of what we just said. Okay. So I, I guess I'd go, these are the only two options. I'd go with keeping uh, Brian Ferentz as, uh, at the moment if it means actually getting to see what he calls instead of Kirk. Um, this one's for me. Would you rather college football impose a mandatory injury report or just keep things the way they are now? I think because of legalized sports betting, you have to have a mandatory injury report to some degree. And the number not, of people who just completely were screwed over because of Mo Ibrahim yeah. not knowing anything about that. Yeah, and the ability to maybe sell that information on a black market or for a player oh, to do yeah. it. Okay. Um, I think, now I don't know how that applies to, um, you know, non scholarship, non paid athletes with HIPAA laws, but of course they're all about to be paid here probably sooner rather than later, which maybe throws that out, you know, blows that provision up as well. But uh, I think with legalized sports wagering, you need as much transparency across all levels, including officiating everything as possible. That's what I would suggest. For you, would you rather have to fix the Iowa offense or the Wisconsin offense right now? Well, the Iowa offense, because I'm an Iowa fan. But um, Jim, um, no, <laughs> it's if, a good answer, if, actually. If I walked uh, right into that one. I deserve it. Uh, if, if I'm looking at this as objectively as I can... You know, I'm, I've been pretty impressed with Caleb Johnson for, for Iowa. The Michigan freshman, recruited him. Yeah. Freshman running back. Um, but I, 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 I guess I would say Wisconsin's offense because of uh, Braylon Allen. And uh, the, I, I just think, you know, if all else fails, you run a gap st- scheme like we've talked about a little bit before. Easy, easy to just 
it should be easy to just pick up three yards, three and a half yards every single uh, down. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I would, I would go with Wisconsin's offense if I'm being uh, objective as possible. Final one is for you. Would you rather bet Illinois or Purdue to win the Big Ten West right now? I think I'd rather bet Purdue, but a lot of that is based off my preseason assumptions. And you'll recall when I put my preview out in July, remember me telling you that one of the hardest decisions I had to make was Purdue or Minnesota to win the West. And I mean, I went back and forth on that for weeks. I had different versions of my preview with each event occurring and finally just decided since Minnesota got the game at home that they would win. They'd both end up tied for the division and that tiebreaker would favor Minnesota. Well, that may be the outcome actually, but it it goes the other way to Purdue. And I still think there are, here's the thing, I'd rather have Aiden O'Connell trying to win me a division than Tommy DeVito. And I, I mean, I, Illinois is arriving a year ahead of schedule, according to my numbers. I think Brett Bielema right now is the clear favorite for Big Ten Coach of the Year. And you know I love his swagger, and I always have, okay? But in the end, I would if, if, if we're playing in November, I mean, this is, a very, this is a very possible scenario. Thanksgiving weekend, five teams in the West go into that with a shot at winning the division in some way, shape, or form, right? So you've got a must-win game. Who do you want as your quarterback? Tommy DeVito. Forget the opponent. Tommy DeVito or Aiden O'Connell. O'Connell. I want, and in both of those scenarios, you're playing an in-state rival, right? Northwest Illinois is going to play Northwestern, and, and you know Pat Fitzgerald will have nothing more to play to play spoiler. Tom Allen might be needing to win that game to save his job at Indiana by winning the old Oaken Bucket, right? So again, who would I rather have in that spot? Is I love Chase Brown. I love that Illinois defense. But a lot of times, man, these games come down to quarterback. That's what happened this past week. Aiden O'Connell made a throw or two in the end that Tanner Morgan could not. And so I think I'd rather have Aiden O'Connell in, uh, in, the, uh, in the mosh pit with me at this point than Tommy DeVito. Speaking of Aiden O'Connell, by the way, have you seen that Charlie Jones' numbers nationally at receiver? No. And he's like top three in the country in receiving yards, receptions, receiving touchdowns. He's like the favorite for the Bolitnikoff Award wow. at head, heading into the halfway part of the wow. season. So how does that make you feel, good, Mr. Brian Ferentz? Good, good, for, good for him. There's, there's something that crossed my mind on, along those lines. Mm-hmm. I think maybe the Iowa coaching staff actually came to the same conclusion that Charlie Jones did. After and nudged spring. and said, hey, man, you know, we want you to make a living. Thank you for your time to our duty here. And Oh, may, maybe. Oh, it wasn't no. friendly? Oh, okay. No, okay. no. I think they might have come to the same conclusion like, holy crap, we are kind of bad. Let's just kind of pack it in this year. And uh, Oh, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, there's part of me that thinks maybe they kind of knew that this thing was going to not turn out super. I mean, you look at some of the personnel coaching decisions they made over the off season. They have a new, they, who's the Abdul Hodge, you know, you remember him? Yeah. He's, I, he's coaching he, linebackers. He played when now. I covered the team. Yeah. He's coaching. So there, I don't know. There's something there. There's something there. I think that, but maybe they were, maybe, maybe they were uh, the way that you took it. Maybe they were uh, uh, magnanimous and told him, Hey, go, you know, go do your thing. But I, I doubt that happened. I will right, we'll come back, wrap things up here on bigger 10 in a moment. Let me take the price picks thing off. I'll do that. This week's Twitter poll results. We asked you, every team in the Big Ten West has at least one conference loss already, and we just started conference play. Will this be the first time ever that a division champion in the Big Ten has three conference losses? 74% of you said yes. 26% of you said no. And I think I would vote yes, Aaron. What say you? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, this is, this is, ugh. I, I, the attrition, the battle of attrition that the Big Ten West is, is not playing out like it is in the in the Big Twelve. That's more entertaining. This is just a lot of really sloppy kind of wheel of destiny. Wheel of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I don't know. Or or depending on how you look at it, um, uh, Russian roulette. Just spin the uh, uh, that's <laughs> red kind bandana of, scene. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is this is kind of playing out like that. So unquestionably, I think there's going to be three losses. Could be a scenario where there's even even more that I, that boggles the mind, but it could happen. Current ESPN FPI projects Purdue and Minnesota to tie for the division lead at six and three. And obviously with Purdue winning at Minnesota, that would send the Boilermakers to Indianapolis. That's the current ESPN FPI projection. All right, let's get to our feedback of the week. It's from Tyler Hawk. 
who says, hey, that Illinois win was great, but it's really a bigger statement by Wisconsin. They just showed the whole country how bad they are. Illinois is a much improved team, no doubt. But this version of Wisconsin is the worst yeah. one in the last 25 years. Well, somebody, in, as we talked about at the top of the show, Aaron, somebody in the administration there, you have former Wisconsin Badger great Chris McIntosh, Barry Alvarez, player, disciple. He's calling the shots there now in the AD. He obviously agrees to some extent because they made that move that we've already discussed here on the show. That was my takeaway as well. Bigger than uh, the Purdue upset, uh, bigger than the Iowa-Michigan game. That was kind of the biggest storyline out of the Big Ten this weekend. I mean, hats off to Illinois. Wisconsin is always going to be difficult, but to just completely demolish them. I, I cannot, I cannot, it's it's surreal. It's like something has shifted in the universe. Two rushing yards for Wisconsin, mm-hmm. like we talked about. Yeah, it's a bad team. Take nothing away from Illinois, but I think that was the bigger statement. It was that Wisconsin is just doesn't really have much there there right now. If Illinois had not just handed Indiana that game on that Friday night yeah. about a month ago. Yep. Now, and, and also Illinois got screwed. I mean, one of the worst screw jobs by a Big Ten officiating crew so far this year was not counting that touchdown, right? And Illinois had to kick and a field goal. And that was goal. the difference in the and game, And that was literally. the difference in the game. They literally lost by four points. That was the difference in the game right there, okay? But if they had not lost that game to Indiana, like, would they be the clear favorite in the Big Ten West right now? No. Well, Yeah. Actually, I don't know because there's a just a you know there's a bucket full of of schlock right now right. Uh, that is the Big Ten West. Right. I hesitated because I'd still say Minnesota, but then they you know Chris Outmandel, big deal, but they still got things done against Michigan State pretty convincingly. You're finding out with Minnesota they are more vulnerable when they lose their chess pieces, and and so is every team. Yep. But there's not just the automatic backup. Okay, next man up, Mo Ibrahim and Chris Ottman Bell, and maybe to a bit greater extent Ibrahim mean a lot to that offense, and they just could not do a darn thing. It still surprised me though. Remember how depleted they were at running back last year, and they still found ways with guys mm-hmm. you didn't know like Tyler Potts and others to run the football, right? So credit to Purdue for that one. And yeah, we're just going to be spinning the wheel of destiny weekly in the Big Ten West now, it appears, the rest of the way. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Bigger Ten. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, five-star, review, share, however, whether it's on YouTube or iTunes or Stitcher and wherever, whether on your device or on a computer, you watch or listen. Help us to find more Big Ten fans just like you. You can also follow us on our Twitter feed. At Bigger 10 on Twitter. At Bigger 10 on Twitter. Until the next time, for Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you then right here on Bigger 10.